So Mark is based in Montreal, but is a very, very um, scrupulous and interesting scholar of a lot of the political dynamics within the left, especially in the American left. One of the debates is on the race, class, identity politics front, people accuse the other side of being reductive. And Mark, I want to begin by talking and inviting you to talk a little bit about this context of um, this wider debate, how you understand it. And I also want to ask you to elaborate on the concept you've developed, uh, which you call non-reductive materialism. Uh, I really found that quite compelling. Right. Oh, thanks, Daniel. Um, thanks for those kind words and inviting me to your show. Um, the um, notion of uh, non-reductionist materialism, I didn't invent that, actually. Uh, uh, for, in my view, that's simply Marxism. <laughs> uh, Marxism in terms of uh, a method that is premised on dialectics is essentially non-reductionist. Um, and um, I was a, a student of Janet Wolf at uh, the University of Rochester in the program in visual and cultural studies. And uh, before uh, starting that program, uh, between my, my uh, MA in art history and my PhD in um, cultural studies, I had done a lot of, uh, about three years of sort of self-guided research. I was very much interested at that time, which is a, a popular subject, postmodern um, urban theory, mm. um, uh, Marxist geography. Um, I was very interested in the, the debate around David Harvey's work in uh, the condition of postmodernity. And coming out of art history uh, at Concordia in Montreal, which had um, a good number of feminist art historians. I was very sensitive to the, the feminist critique of uh, Marxist geography. And um, so a lot of the debates that we're having today are um, not entirely new, of course. I mean, some of these debates go back to the 1960s. Um, in the 1990s, they had uh, their own kinds of um, directions in terms of uh, not so much uh, social movement activism, but more like scholarly work. Um, so by the 90s, you have like um, postmodern theory. In the 80s, postmodern theory in North America was, you know, very new in a sense, although mm -hmm. a lot of the ideas come from French theory in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, but by the 1990s, all of that had kind of settled in, you could say, in, in the um, social sciences and humanities, uh, especially in the art world mm -hmm. where, um, you know, trendy concepts, you know, circulate, you know, in some ways much more quickly than in mm -hmm. some disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, feminist critique of Marxist geography was one of the subjects that was um, um, spread throughout almost all of cultural studies at a certain point. Hmm. Um, I was I was very much interested in the work of Rosalind Deutsch, mm -hmm. who's a um, contemporary art historian uh, who worked a lot in um, urban studies and the critique of uh, gentrification, the sort of Mike Davis kind of uh, subject area. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, mainstays of her research was radical democracy. So in the 1990s, um, I mean, coming out of, um, oh, actually, no, th this research I was doing was between my BA and my MA, actually, before my mm -hmm. PhD. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't, I did a BA in history, so we weren't taught a lot of postmodern theory. I kind of had to do all of that research on my own, basically, mm -hmm. except for maybe one professor. I had as an undergraduate who was um, introducing us to some concepts in postmodern theory and French yeah. theory. Interesting. Um, so, so postmodern theory um, has a genealogical uh, link. Let's say there's a kind of through line to some of these more recent debates and some of these more recent kind of that take on a kind of hysterical 
status around, um, you know, inter intersectional politics, um, race first politics or class first politics. And your position is that Marxism rejects both uh, orientations and is 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 be better characterized as definitely non-reductive. Ma mainly, Marxism is not a vulgar, you know, conception of class or anything like that, even though it is accused of being so, right? Um, right. I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, because I think some of this um, genealogy, if you want to call it that, some of this history, I think is important to how we um, go about um, conceiving these, these uh, debates, let's say, yeah, at this please. moment. Please. So um, radical democracy was, in a way, the, the go-to left-wing um, approach within the social sciences of, 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 the, of the type that was also involved in feminist psychoanalysis. So that um, what really changed, what really shifted that conversation, that, that was a very strong uh, moment, movement, although I was always, in a way, as a Marxist, I was always more convinced by Jameson and Harvey and some of these thinkers, Henri Lefebvre, who influenced both of them. Um, but I was, you know, interested in the feminist critique. And it's really Zizek's work uh, with the sublime object of ideology in 89. And um, in 2000, uh, contingency, hegemony, universality, the three-way conversation between Laclau, Butler, and Zizek, those are, for me, kind of, uh, those are milestones. Um, those are key moments. And of course, once Zizek's work became very well known uh, in the early 2000s, uh, there was more interest given to the work of Badiou. So the reception of Badiou was delayed, and I think enabled to some extent by the reception of the work of Zizek. Um, and so in the early 2000s, both of these thinkers in parallel in some ways with the work of Hart and Negri and the influence of empire on new social movements. These were the sort of like uh, two left wing um, strands that um, built a lot of the momentum, at least on an academic level for a kind of, I, I don't like to use the term renewal or return to, um, to a kind of, let's say uh, almost uh, modernist, if you will, like pre postmodern conception of socialism, communism, class struggle, class analysis, and what have you. Um, although, you know, some people will refer to Zizek's work as post-Marxist, partly because it's based in Lacan, who's a structuralist in a way. Um, so, you know, there's no like, uh, there's no pure kind of intellectual space for these discussions. Um, and um, when I was doing my, uh, work with Janet Wolf, um, I was interested in um, doing some sort of groundwork in Marxist study. And uh, she always emphasized this non-reductionist understanding of Marxism. Um, and so, you know, I have her to thank for that a little bit because she sort of kept, you know, insisting on it. And um, this was in some ways uh, also the kind of uh, cultural studies take on Marxism as well, because a lot of cultural studies, insofar as it, it is a form of uh, Marxist, insofar as it's a form of Marxist theory, or at least has Marxism as a, as a you know, strong element in it, um, was by and large post-Althusserian theory, in essence. And so in some ways, you didn't have to worry too much about the legacy of the left. You, you can kind of take off from you know, this moment in the 60s and 70s in a, in a um, cultural studies sense where you can look at ideological superstructures and not concern yourself necessarily too much with political economy. <clears throat> so not concern yourself too much with, um, you know, the kind of demands that are uh, imposed on Marxists vis-a-vis -vis class analysis. So in a way, sorry, in a way, Althusser, maybe not intentionally, but the legacy of Althusserian approaches and, and critical theory and so on, um, deprivileged political economy. Is that, what, is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, it kind of sidelined, I mean, political economy would be determinant in the last instance. And, you know, in cultural studies, the last instance never has to arrive, right? So it's always in a way deferred or postponed. 
Um, and so you can kind of work on ideological superstructures. You can work on questions of culture. You can work on questions of ideology or ideology critique um, without having to have a kind of, you know, third or fourth international uh, approach to um, the work that you do as a quote unquote party artist. You didn't have to be, uh, you know, affiliated with a party to be doing um, something like uh, a new left, let's say, um, form of um, left wing uh, Marxist derived uh, critique of capitalism. So, you know, you could have your you could have your capitalism and eat it, too. It's kind of what uh, cultural studies was offering people. And in this more um, like um, post-structuralist vein, uh, you had a lot of competing uh, tendencies within cultural studies. Right. So you had some people who were in a way much more uh, post-structuralist without the Marxist um, trappings of cultural studies, you know, without being concerned with something like readings of the Grundrisse. Um, and, you know, these were, these were like areas of, of competition and debate in the academy, especially in the 90s as the academy was being neoliberalized. I mean, it was happening before our very eyes. There were uh, some, some books that were coming out on the subject. This is, you know, a decade before um, a lot of the kind of uh, studies that had been made of the neoliberal university uh, a little bit later on, like uh, Aronowitz is the knowledge factory kind of and um, edu factory sort of new social movement critiques. Um, so at that time, you had something like um, the Devil's Dictionary. I think it's Carrie Nelson, the Devil's Dictionary of Higher Education, sort of how to navigate this neoliberal moment. And um, a, a key text also is Bill Redding's The University in Ruins, which is uh, very, uh, very perceptive, uh, coming from a kind of postmodern, post-structural theory area, critique of the university as uh, what he called the university of excellence. Um, so the university of excellence has a concern with excellence in all areas, uh, including, uh, you know, university parking services, the university gymnasium, the cafeteria, all of these kind of, you know, this kind of um, neoliberal museum where the, where the boutique and the, the, the gift shop and the, the, the food services are as important and part of the experience of um, higher education or culture um, as anything else. And so this was sort of the moment in which management was basically taking over the university. Uh, whereas in the past it was faculty, uh, a faculty dominated institution. Uh, now it was management dictating the terms of um, knowledge production um, and therefore knowledge consumption. Um, and uh, so the, the Bill Redding's book was interesting to me because one of the things that it mentioned was this idea I think he took from Agamben um, about the international petty bourgeoisie, um, that the international petty bourgeoisie is a, a class that does not acknowledge any kind of class identity, any kind of class definition. So it's a kind of post-class way of thinking and also post-national. Uh, even though right now we're talking a lot about nationalism uh, with like left and right wing populism, we have this kind of like resurgence of nationalism and e either in a good way or in a bad way. Um, but at that time, you know, you had what was developing as globalism, right? In part as a response to the impulse towards global competition by neoconservative and neoliberal regimes, but also in a cultural sense as a sort of global culture that is consuming much of the same culture worldwide as anyone else. And so uh, a kind of post-class uh, petty board, global petty bourgeoisie and also post-national global petty bourgeoisie. And so uh, that in a way led to a different um, sort of research agenda for me insofar as I was uh, leaving the doctoral studies 
uh, situation, getting into teaching. And I only taught at university for four years. I, I became an independent scholar in uh, 2006. Um, and that, you know, allowed me to really do the kind of research that I want to do without any kind of super ego, uh, you know, massaging of um, my research. Um, so, I mean, for good and bad, you, you get you're on your own and you can do what you want. And so these themes that I had kind of really been interested, but that didn't seem to be the kind of thing that, um, you know, the, the, the discipline wanted or the field wanted, um, I got to do. And so one of those things was... Um, First of all, focusing on class, um, because uh, attention to Marxism, to class analysis was very much uh, uh, discouraged in the universe, in my university experience. Uh, and I mean, I, I feel like that young people today are really lucky. Who, I mean, who are leftists, who like uh, the person you had on your show a few weeks ago, David Green. Uh, Doug. Yeah, Doug. Mm -hmm. Oh, Doug Green. Yeah. Um, I think I, I mean it's it's music to my ears to hear someone like him doing that kind of research. Yeah. Uh, because I couldn't do that kind of research in the '90s. Right. Like I mean, you just couldn't do it. I tried right. to do it, and I was prevented right. from doing it. Right. You know? So um, so so the the so let's let's make an inventory so far. This has been great. So at a certain wow. point, the '90s bureaucratizes the class. Uh, which is at the forefront of, of, let's say, stabilizing and managing that process is the petty bourgeoisie. And um, this is another name for what Catherine Liu calls the professional managerial class. But what you're pointing attention to is that it's composed of what, um, in Marxist thought, is the petty bourgeois class, which is paradoxically not really a class. Why is it not why does it not see itself as a class? What what's up with that exactly? What what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, there's an um, an article by um, Steve Edwards on Nonsite that was published a few weeks ago, um, where he quotes um, Eric Olin Wright on this issue, and um, Olin Wright says that um, the petty bourgeoisie is defined by its contradictory class location. So it's between the working class and the bourgeoisie. Um, and, uh, I mean, he kind of, uh, Edwards sort of denies that concept and then goes on to like basically, um, reassert it in, in a, in a displaced or in, di in a different way. Um, so, I mean, whether or not, I mean, from a Marxist point of view, uh, the petty bourgeoisie is not a class in a, in a classic orthodox Marxist sense. Um, it's not a class in its own right. Um. And there are, you know, debates on, uh, for example, productive and non-productive labor, um, because it's sort of like uh, Marx's discussion of the difference between a piano player and a piano maker. The piano maker is productive because they're making objects that are then sold and therefore produce value, exchange value, whereas the performer is producing something that is consumed at the moment of its of its production. And so it doesn't produce value, even though there's circulation of money in terms of ticket sales and that sort of thing. Um, but then the problem gets displaced to the to the extent that what's the point of making pianos if no one's going to be event, going to be playing them? Um, and so uh, um, different kinds of um, professions like accountants, for example, or secretaries or nurses, health uh, care workers are not in a classic Marxist sense considered uh, productive workers. And so they're somewhere in between um, the bourgeoisie and the working class. And uh, depending on their identifications and the stakes that are at play in their practice, whether they identify as workers or they identify as uh, you know, a member of the upper class or the ruling class. Um, so it's not quite the same problem as uh, Gramscian hegemony um, which, you know, is, has to do with like, in a way, your identification, uh, your political identification, uh, because in the case of hegemony, you can be, you can identify with the bourgeoisie and still be in the working class. Uh, the petty bourgeoisie is a, a little bit more of a, um, a conundrum, let's say, for the uh, communist uh, left. And yeah. so attention to the petty bourgeoisie 
um, has historically be con been, been considered a form of revisionism. It's right. like taking it's like taking a step backwards. You're sort of a, avoiding the the, re the true contradiction between labor and capital, and you know filling it up with all of these diversions, uh, like cultural issues, for example, mm -hmm. or or mm -hmm. uh, critical legal studies, or you know these kinds of philo philosophical questions. Right, that according to a certain reading of uh, Marx's um, theses on Feuerbach, uh, mm -hmm. should, you know, should simply be abandoned. Which is, by the way, not my understanding of the eleventh thesis. Um, on the contrary, questions of philosophy are essential to Marxism. Yeah. And so, so in my mind, is this issue of uh, you know what are the what were in the twentieth century the impediments to what was assumed in some measure to be an inevitable process, or mm -hmm. at, at least a process that <clears throat> you were aware of what um, the stakes in the struggle were, and you were aware of the means of uh, struggle, which was mm -hmm. to organize the working class internationally to overthrow the global bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the thirties, especially with the rise of fascism, fascism sort of, fascism is what in some ways threw a wrench in this like mechanistic version of uh, communism, mm. and you know, it was like, why did why did this happen? Why did uh, wor working people decide to support national bourgeoisies rather than their international brothers and sisters? Um, one of the answers is in a book by um, Lefebvre. It's a co-authored book called Mystified Consciousness. Um, and it's a sort of example of the type of work that you find in uh, the Frankfurt School. Um, I don't in any way think that the Frankfurt School is, is um, revisionist. I think it's essential to uh, any kind of contemporary socialism. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I myself, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about these issues about uh, the petty bourgeoisie mm -hmm. as, a, as a class um, but I, I want to get to this reductionist uh, issue in a second. Um, the uh, one of the I mean, part of what how I think has to do with the fact that I'm a cultural theorist primarily. And so, you know, references in the field of um, cultural theory are are, you know, some of the things I'm thinking about. And uh, an important influence on my work is Pierre Bourdieu. For some people who are, let's say, postmodernist and post-structuralist, Pierre Bourdieu is the worst kind of reductionist sociology. <laughs> he gets, he really gets panned, and right. it's and it's very ironic because among the Marxists, no one is closer to Foucault than Bourdieu, mm. um, yeah. and and so it's it's odd that uh, I mean it's really a matter just it's just a matter of like. Um, will really at the end yeah. of the day i had the i had the opinion that um there's a you know because in the in the studies of academics that do you know citations which doesn't really tell you much but you know quantitatively i think bourdieu is at the very top and there's a there's a schadenfreude aspect there in the sense that if you read what bourdieu says about intellectuals it hurts like it's painful for an academic because he pulls the rug out and he he says it as it is. And I think that there is a kind of um, a strength of his critique. I mean, for example, if you read his book, Pascalian Meditations on, on Philosophers, God, it's an incredible, it, I mean, it all, it, all, it all makes sense. You know, why, why, did, why does analytic philosophy have nothing to say about politics? Why did American uh, analytic philosophers basically kick Adorno and Horkheimer out of America, which they did, right? Um, Bourdieu gives you a way to, to get at that. He gives you so much, right? Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a shame that he is sort of sort of treated that way. So I sorry, I'm just giving him a little. Please. Yeah, continue. I mean, I'll get back to this Pascal uh, question maybe later if if we have time to talk about um, Macbeth. I'm mm. sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that, but um, mm. um, yeah, and uh, so. The um, one of the key texts for um, art scholars, uh, is, art historians or theorists is distinction. Uh, the rules of art is brilliant. I mean, his his culture, his erudition is astounding. It, it just makes 
people like me look like, you know, amateurs. And um, one of the, uh, I mean, he, he does this kind of reductionist class analysis in uh, distinction where he looks at, I mean, you know, the, the concept of habitus, the sort of the class predispositions of different groups. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of what he says is is dated. I mean, the, the research is from the, I think, late 60s, the, the, the uh, empirical research for that right. book is from the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Mm. Mm. And it's published in 79. Mm. And um, but at one point in the book, he sort of says, you know, he does this kind of uh, structuralist um, synchronic uh, analysis. And so let's look at the, the let's look at the bourgeois habitus. Let's look at the petty bourgeois habitus and let's look at the working class habitus. Right. I might I might disagree with Catherine Liu uh, around here, around around this point. Mm. Um, but she doesn't really cite Bourdieu, but anyways. Yeah, great. yeah. She cites, um, I mean, some of the other key references are uh, White Collar by C. Wright Mills mm -hmm. and Siegfried Krakauer, mm. um, The Salaried Masses. Mm -hmm. The Salaried Masses is just a joy to read. Mm. Um, the way that, the, the, the sort of, it's interesting because, I mean, for people like me, where you're kind of always you're starved for class analysis in a sense right. Right? because we're 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 so today really a, a petty bourgeois culture right um, but at that time class distinctions were still kind of the kind of they were the sort of things that at that time were as foremost in people's minds as race consciousness is today mm. in terms of anti-racism so all mm. of the sort of little things you know that we notice about whatever yeah. whatever film or whatever political um uh, exchange, you know, at that right. time, a lot of it was around class. And that means that class contradictions were more evident, you could, you know, analytically, right? Is that is that kind of what the consequence is in a way? Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, yeah. uh, these class contradictions would have been evident from, let's say, about 1850 to about 1950. Yeah, uh, post post war is where the whole is where the shift takes place. Yeah, post war is where you get a kind of um, countercultural shift right so instead of things being between uh left and right or bourgeois and working class they become old and new or hip and cool hmm. like those are the those are the new kinds of uh, you know structuring uh, hmm. concerns hmm. among um intellectuals artists and activists for right. example so um so there's Krakauer, uh, C. Wright Mills's White Collar, which is a sort of like forerunner to something like Andrew Ross's No Collar, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to sort of bring it more up to date. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Bourdieu does an interesting thing with his uh, different class habituses. And so the, um, the bourgeois habitus when it comes to culture is what he would define as the field of legitimate culture. So that the bourgeoisie, because uh, let's say you're, you're born in, in an expensive uh, home, you're surrounded with works of art, your parents have been acculturated into understanding theater, opera, classical music, uh, literature, you know, there are uh, classics of literature in your home. So having read, let's say Frankenstein at a young age, is not necessarily something surprising. You didn't need to have it introduced to you in school with Cole's notes as a way to sort of sweeten the deal. Um, so that's the kind of like the definition of legitimate culture, which is in a way the person who has, who possesses the habitus uh, has that knowledge. They, so it, it, it doesn't have to be fact checked. It's just part of a disposition. Um, and it's a dis it's a it's the proper approach to culture in this Kantian sense, where it's disinterested. It's something that you do purely for its own sake. It's uh, something that is about the, you know the pleasure that comes from it and the knowledge that comes from it as well. Um, the petty bourgeoisie is in a much more anxious uh, relation to this bourgeois uh, culture in a sense that, you don't, it's sort of like a Woody Allen's uh, small time crooks. You have working class people who suddenly come into a lot of money, all of a sudden they're nouveau riche. And so they're taking courses so that they could anxiously 
in a way have the proper manners so that when they associate with other people in the upper class, they don't seem like rubes. Um, so the petty bourgeoisie is in this kind of anxious um, situation vis-a-vis -vis genuine culture. Um, the working class is almost um, inoperative when it comes to culture. They don't know it. They don't have uh, use for it. Uh, their life is, is defined by the necessity of, of survival. Um, and so they may even take a kind of reverse snob approach to high culture. Like they would refuse it. They would, they would why bother with that? And they, they may just simply reject it. Um, so the idea of the sort of communist um, goal of bringing culture to the masses through education is a, a sort of paradoxical uh, task, right? Because what does it mean to be introducing the working class to bourgeois ways of thinking and bourgeois habits? Um, and, and this is something that disappears when you're in a neoliberal, petty bourgeois global um, situation. There's no longer that, that uh, responsibility, basically, because you've entered um, an era of post-responsibility. You've entered an era of post-representation when it comes to uh, science, uh, knowledge, uh, culture, politics. Um, the, the phrase I use, I borrow a term from Marcuse in terms of sexual manners, uh, countercultural sexual mores. Uh, he referred to this, the hippie lifestyle, the quote unquote hippie lifestyle as repressive desublimation. Um, and so what the petty bourgeois habitus does in the area of culture and politics is a repressive desublimation of politics, a repressive desublimation of culture. <clears throat> so what appears to be more carefree, more relaxed, uh, and in some cases it means also uh, more, more barbaric in a sense, like your approach to culture can be just more barbaric, like go out there and, and get culture, right? In the sense that, um, you know, the, the, uh, a, a legitimate approach to culture wouldn't be so mercenary. It wouldn't be so goal oriented or instrumental, right? You kind of, you acquire culture because you enjoy culture. You're not, you know, anxious to go out there and, you know, dominate the field. Um, so uh, the, the point of the, the, this three-part um, analysis is to say that the, the bourgeois habitus is dominant. It's the universal, basically. It's the, ab it's the kind of, uh, it's both the concrete and the abstract universal. Um, the petty bourgeoisie is either, is, is, is either in a position of resentment vis-a-vis -vis the, the greater cultural capital of the bourgeoisie, or in the terms of the professions of the executant petty bourgeoisie, like for example, people in the mass media, like people in advertising, um, they're more anxious to to you know sort of like acquire that knowledge, and uh, often in this kind of like slightly hurried way, right? And so, in other words, there's a lot of bluff. You can kind of look cultured if you dress the part, for example, if you have flair if you sort of perform um, this kind of bourgeois habitus. Um, so looking like appearing um, cultured becomes as important as being cultured. And in fact, um, at the point in the post-war period, this is kind of my theory, in the post-war period, the petty bourgeois habitus becomes dominant. The bourgeois habitus gets displaced. It gets, it gets in a way marginalized. Um, so you get this kind of, uh, if, if you're familiar with the work of Necht and Kluge, um, they, they wrote a book called Public Sphere and Experience. It's a brilliant response to uh, Jürgen Habermas's The Structural Transformation of the Bourgeois Public Sphere. Mm. So uh, Habermas was... Just to, just to give you a synopsis, um, how bourgeois publicity, which would be kind of like Republican virtues in the mm -hmm. small r Republican sense, mm -hmm. uh, bourgeois publicity, like, um, you know, a parliamentary democracy, uh, enlightenment in, the, in, in fields like uh, museums, universities, libraries, uh, medicine, um, being that kind of publicity being replaced by 
consumer culture publicity, mm. uh, markets, public relations, these kinds of um, forced needs, these kind of created needs that have more to do with the, the quest for, for capital accumulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of people have criticized Habermas for writing what seems like a lament for the disappearance of uh, bourgeois publicity. Mm. Um, it was seen as a kind of Frankfurt School, uh, kind of Benjaminian negative dialectics. And so the cultural studies mind kind of re uh, uh, reacts to this lament for a, a dying bourgeoisie and says, well, no, we should welcome this. This is the best thing that, that I see. That, this is what we wanted. Um, yeah. But it's it's like this. It's sort of like the uh, neoconservative attack on the professions. What yeah. that does is it simply opens the field for the neoliberalization of knowledge markets. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so this, this is fascinating. I mean, there's a, there's another Bernard Stiegler who does media studies philosophy. He died, I think, two years ago. One one year ago, maybe. He has the argument uh, in his in his wonderful critique of Herbert Marcuse. Uh, which I think is a very sound one on many levels, but one one in particular um, is that you know late capitalism. These dynamics we're talking about can be analyzed from a number of different registers. But one problem is that capitalism basically has killed desire in a psychoanalytic sense. And um, what that actually means for Stiegler is that you need to carefully bring back some type of well, well, reinvent what he calls a kind of uh, social super ego, basically, um, because right now things, the social authority mechanisms and so on is too, are, are just so extraordinarily acephalic. And it, it, it introduces a kind of ethical political problem in a way, which is, yeah, how do you deal with this, um, with these, I don't know when to call them paradoxes, but you know, uh, if the petty bourgeois habitus is the predominant habitus, where is the bourgeois habitus? Is it is it absent? Is it is it a kind of vanishing mediator, in a way? I'm curious. What, how would you say that? Like what? Because it's it's still informing. Yeah. Things. I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is um, a study. Uh, there, I mean, there are different ways of thinking about it, and this is very much kind of the kind of question, not kind of kind of, but like the kind of question that um, that concerns me. Um, I'll get back to this. Well, uh, I, I've got like, you know, three streams here. Um, so let me, let me try to cover all of yeah, them. I haven't, I haven't forgot about non-reductive materialism. We will come back to it. It's all coming. It's all coming around to it that will, first it will come question. Around. Um, so Necht and Kluge, they use a, a sociological Marxist, uh, uh perspective. Um, Kluge is a filmmaker. Um, he's part of the new German cinema. Um, he's a lawyer who is very much concerned with this. Basically, I mean, uh, it's interesting for fans of Adorno because uh, Adorno wrote, you know, Adorno was like uh, so not into the culture industry that he didn't defend a lot of contemporary artists. Um, Kluge was one of the only ones that he actually had uh, something um, positive to say about. Um, it's called, uh, the essay is called Transparencies on Film. And um, he, uh, so he was interested in like, you know, a kind of re response, a critical response to media cartels. Um, and so he wrote this sociology with uh, Necht. And um, they, their argument, it's interesting because it's also cultural theory at the same time that it's, economic analysis and sociology. It's a brilliant book that's underappreciated. The only kind of, the only problem with it is that it's, it's sort of ground line, it's base, if you, if you will, in some ways, is this question of experience. Um, and so you have a kind of non-discursive subjectivity that's always, in, in a way, always there. And then on top of it, you have a, a decaying bourgeois superstructure replaced by basically a petty bourgeois, uh, what they call production public spheres. So rather than the, the classic Habermasian public sphere, which is a space of disinterested dis discussion where you leave aside your personal and private uh, concerns and you, you debate 
issues of public uh, good and public needs and public interest, that is kind of disappearing. And so what that, seen, that's like Kant's whole model and what is enlightenment, right? Yeah. The whole, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so uh, Habermas is kind of lamenting the disappearance of this. The Foucauldians are, are excited, you know, finally. Um, and uh, the young conservatives, and uh, as Habermas called them, um, but uh, uh, Necht and Kluge kind of, they sort of, I mean, if you're a Foucauldian, you could get into Necht and Kluge in some ways, right? Uh, because their work is not, uh, in, a, in a way, it's not holding up the model of this, this disappeared bourgeois public sphere. Um, and what they're saying is what you have instead is you have people, uh, it's a little bit almost like Hard and Negri, you know, avant la lettre. Uh, you have production public spheres, which are basically commercialized, capitalized um, institutions, uh, you know, cor corporations. And this would include political parties. It would include uh, left uh, organizations like like today's like uh, left streamers, for example. They would be in the same sort of like uh, morass, petty bourgeois morass of production public spheres. Um, and and the only thing we're outside, all, we're all in it. We're all swimming in these 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 turbulent waters here. Of necessity, in one way, in one way or another, uh, or uh, for good and bad. Um, and so, like the only thing outside of that is, you know, this kind of Zizekian subjectivity, right? Like for Zizek, every everything is somewhere between Kant and Hegel. Like the only thing interesting is between Kant and Hegel. Um, and for Necht and Kluge, that's experience. So that if, so, if you come back to um, Bourdieu, um, there's a kind of like there's a subject somewhere. There's a psychoanalytic subject somewhere in Bourdieu, though he tends to avoid uh, psychoanalysis. Right? He's aware of it. It's on the margins of his thinking. And um, so, you know, if in terms of habitus, there are two there are two two things that that uh, occur. One is if something new shows up. You have a there's bodily hy hysteresis and bodily hexis, and so if you think of like memes and um, viral culture, hexis is that you kind of like go with the flow, you know, you sort of like join join the crowd, um, you blend in, you're outer oriented, um, and hysteresis is you react, you know, you have a hysterical reaction. A typical conservative doesn't like anything new, you know, prefers everything. Um, stayed. Right. Um, so there's a subject somewhere, right? Who's kind yeah, of this like, is hysteresis. Hmm. If you remember in Borges, um, Homo Academicus, he used that category to describe the 68ers, the 68ers uh -huh. students. And one of the ways that Borges analysis of 68, I think is quite nice. is basically that in a way that kind of, uh, it was almost a kind of post-war generational, um, downward mobility where you had a kind of glutting of the uh, cultural institutions, academic institutions, and a, a failure of the kind of broader promise for, you know, for careers to advance and things of that nature, which by now we've been dealing with that for decades, right? In a certain sense here, right? In, in our context. Um, but but um, I really like that category. And I wonder if you might say a little bit more about it. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. Um, the uh, I guess a precursor to this is the what's called the the Bohemian avant-garde. These are the the artists who came after realism. Realism was a reaction to romanticism, and the at a certain point there were so many academic painters who could who could paint naturalist and realist images that the the market was was saturated, and that's where the impressionists. And the post -press post impressionists come out. Uh, they had to, in a, in a way, invent a new technique that would stand out from the crowd of all of these academic painters. Um, and so the Bohemian avant garde are, in a way, a kind of uh, response to uh, market glut. You could see that today uh, with new new social movement activism, like the uh, Jacobin with the laptop idea of so many people with education, but very few outlets, at least in terms of, you know, working in the academy. Um, and in the 60s, it's interesting because I think there's two sides to that uh, process in the 1960s. The other side of that is that 
you're in the midst of post-war economic prosperity. The in France, les trente glorieuses, um, and you could, you know, if you wanted to be a full-time surfer, you know, you could like uh, tune in, turn on, and drop out. Uh, you could like not buy into the system and you know pursue a countercultural lifestyle, a subcultural lifestyle, um, because it was fairly doable because um, the standard of living was going up, was increasing. Things were becoming cheaper. Not every year things were becoming more affordable, not less affordable. Um, so you know that was that's one of the things that makes um, you know dropping out of the system, like attractive uh, to people at that time. Um, so the, uh, the, the, so this idea of um, the petty bourgeois, I mean, and, and, and these kinds of like um, lifestyles, like, like the question of styling of life is, you know, very much part of the consumer culture and po post-war prosperity. So you can call it, um, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You can call it, like I refer to it as McDonald's, nudist beaches, and hula hoops. These are all things that you can do um, that in some ways, like Bourdieu would say, are ways that you escape the gravity of the social field. Like in some ways, and you could think of, uh, just as an aside, um, Power of the Dog, Jane Campion's Power of the Dog, the main character, when you see him with his hula hoop, uh, it's like a, a metal hoop from a barrel, but he's he's using it like a hula hoop. And I was like, why is this, you know, what is this doing in this film? It's kind of like, uh, he, he's sort of like anticipating something. I mean, of course, contemporary films, even if they're, you know, set in an earlier uh, time period, they're also like questions that we're thinking about today. Um, that's just an aside. Um, the, so what happens is that you have... Um, the basically uh, the hegemony of the petty bourgeois habitus so that in a way it's like if you're a, a pmc like museum director uh curator or if you're a department chair uh, uh, for example you're not today concerned with um you know the kind of like mastery of your discipline that in the past was either presumed or expected or at least you know pretended you know but in the, in, the, in the past you didn't have to pretend because there was less competition in academia if you got a job in academia you spent the next 40 years reading books and you knew something and and that was by and large enough to be qualified and you only needed one book in order to make your reputation in the field um so today it's kind of like oh no you have to do all of these things you know you have to have uh <clears throat> A Facebook, you have to have, uh, you know, conferences, you have to have grants, um, you know, you have, you, you want all of these kind of things that, that are sort of extra, you know, they're not necessarily, they're like, it's like the, the dangerous supplement takes over. And right. the, uh, the Ergon is is basically the vanished mediator. And I, I honestly feel just as a personal reflection on that, on that reality is that I'm now 40. And I, I don't really I am going to continue in spite of those material dynamics as best I can. And I have, I need to cultivate an attitude of um, not acceptance of them, but like, I can't allow for the, um, for certain like resentment about it to seep in because it will harm my, my scholarship it will harm my work. So it's it, it, the resentment's not part of the habitus. Yeah, it, it can't be. It's foreclosed. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, like uh, resentment would be the old-fashioned petty bourgeois, like the small shopkeeper, who kind of doesn't really want yeah. to be bourgeois. But yeah, we the habit have... now is is like Byung Chul Han says, it's around this kind of enforced positivity in a certain sense. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Bourdieu uh, refers to this as uh, there's a section called uh, duty and the fun ethic. Um, I was at a I was on a Zoom conference recently for my association, the uh, um, University's Art Association of Canada. And, you know, there's kind of conversation that takes place before the, uh, the Zoom presentation begins. And um, some people were talking about their dogs 
and uh, these kinds of things. And um, someone kind of came in and seemed like they were ready to start <laughs> the presentations. And they were they were kind of like, you know, lamenting in, in a sort of like um, half hearted way um, that you can't have fun anymore. You know, it's like no more fun. It's like, let's let's get to work. Um, and the uh, th that's that's sort of like a misunderstanding of what the petty bourgeois habitus is. The, the, the petty bourgeois habitus isn't that you can't have fun. It's that you must have fun. Um, so it's kind of like uh, Zizek's um, analogous statement about the the person in the 50s who goes to the psychoanalyst and says, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm a philanderer. I have to be with other women. Today, the person goes to their therapist and says, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm reading Bad You and I want to be faithful to my partner. Uh, you know, is this true love? What is this? <laughs> you know, um, so you get a kind of like, you know, postmodern postmodern father, uh, postmodern Oedipus, uh, that is in effect in like all areas, which makes the, the film um, Don't Look Up really like, you know, one of the most Zizekian films to come out, you know, as in the longest time. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, all of this stuff on the on the um, petty bourgeois habitus is extremely helpful. I mean, especially for our viewers, because I always discuss Pierre Bourdieu, but I, I need to do more episodes that really dig into his thought. And there is only one serious researcher that looks at Lacan and Bourdieu, as far as I've seen. Um, and there, there's all kinds of stuff to do there. Michael Bordeaux, or I, I forget how you say his name, at um, I think he's at Berkeley, has a whole series of books and essays on Marx and Bourdieu, which are very worth looking at, I think. Um, but can we return to the, the thread of non-reductive materialism where we where we kind of kick things off so we, right. you're, you're sort of giving us a historical yeah story of how we've got to this moment you're right you, you go back yeah. there i i've worked on bourdieu and lacan too actually um and and in terms of cultural theory uh peter berger uh peter berger's theory of the avant-garde with the bohemian historical and neo avant-gardes mm -hmm. i i update the neo avant-garde with this kind of global petty bourgeoisie, which I argue is the, the moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so that you have in some ways certain, um, and, and this, I mean, this is not, we're not really, by talking about this, we're not avoiding the issue of reductionism and non-reductionism, right? We're, this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's an essay I wrote that's still under peer review called uh, The Uses and Abuses of Class Reductionism for the Left. And there's a kind of a short version of it on uh, my academia page and on my blog called uh, The Mismeasure of Marx, um, which is about, it's a little bit more about contemporary culture wars around race issues and can, like canceling leftists as class reductionists. Um, there's a more recent posting on my blog um, called uh, Woke Baseball on the NATO Front. It's about the kind of, um, it's a sort of about this like war, wartime scenario where, you know, if you're American, for example, you can't, you're not allowed to criticize your government um, in terms of NATO expansion. And because, you know, Putin is invading Russia, so this is not the time to criticize, you know, Biden's foreign policy. Um, and I'm suggesting that there's, you know, a very uh, obvious uh, continuum between cancel culture uh, in terms of like uh, identity issues and these kind of like national international issues. And uh, I, 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 you know, sometimes, you know, Zizek has this idea, uh, Samuel Goldwyn Mayer, we need new cliches. Um, so sometimes I try to come up with formulas. The formulas are always a problem. Slogans are always a problem, but they might help. So I invented this idea of woke baseball. If you're playing uh, baseball, um, let's, I mean, basically the two teams are the woke on one side and on the other side, it would be the left. I mean, it's written, it, it, the idea of woke baseball is, is for leftists. Um, so you have a leftist person uh, who's accused of, let's say, racism. Um, so that's first base. 
you, you could be accused of racism and sexism. That's second base. Racism, sexism, homophobia. That you're on all, on all bases. Um, and there's different uh, pitches that people will throw at you if you're a leftist. Um, so they can throw at you your privilege. Uh, they can throw at you the fact that your ideas are European derived. They can throw at you a post-structuralist uh, kind of um, curve, which is that your ideas are phallogocentric uh, or they're masculinist. You know, these are these are cliches. I mean, they're, they're concepts that are related to bodies of thought and, you know, historical experiences. But they're they're things that can be used like blunt instruments to di to dismiss a leftist. Um, and uh, if you want a, a home run is to accuse a leftist of reductionism, of class reductionism. Um, so, you know, you can kind of cover all the bases if you if you say that the person's class reductionist, you don't have to kind of like do this hermeneutics of suspicion where, you know, something in their thinking implies some kind of, you know, uh, latent Eurocentrism or what have you. Uh, you could just accuse the left of class reductionism. And in the, the art world, in, in, the, in the cultural sector, that's done all the time because cultural studies has been so successful at training people in this post Althusserian mode that even if you're not really a leftist, if you're not really a Marxist, you can always accuse your colleagues of being reductionist. That's a way right. of some, that's a way of pushing them to the side in some ways of, right. of and you know like carrying on basically with a um, an identitarian project that doesn't call itself an identitarian project. So it could be something more kind of like more Foucauldian, like a little bit more vague in the way that it moves and in the in the way that it it uses. Uh, language. So, for example, like queer theory vis-a-vis -vis gay and lesbian uh, politics or mm. gay and lesbian civil rights. There's these mm -hmm. there are debates, for example, between queer theorists who are like basically non-identitarian on, yeah. on some on some level. Um, yeah. So, so I think that, it would be I think it would be really helpful for our listeners who tend to identify or or um, maintain a commitment to to the Marxist orientation here and may even have a, a critique of leftism broadly construed, although that's kind of an incoherent category in a way. It would be interesting to, to if you could elaborate specifically on why Marxism, I know you mentioned at the beginning, but I, I'm really compelled by this. What, how do we sort of frame um, Marxism as a non-reductive analysis of class? I think it might be helpful just to sort of throw that back out on the table. Yeah. Um... To, just to finish the baseball uh, game, um, you, if you a home run, I guess you could say, is if when you accuse the the leftist of being right wing, <laughs> you know, you accuse the Marxists of being uh, like the right because they're modernist or they're uh, you know all of the above of of what was mentioned previously, and you can add uh, ageism, ableism, and you can go on and on uh, with some of these. Um, I guess, you know, they're, they're like uh, red herrings, you know. I mean, in some cases, if they're accurate, then it's not woke baseball, right? Um, so um, the uh, issue of uh, the difference between reductionism and non-reductionism is not a difference between, you know, um, something and not something. So that there is, I mean, this is the issue that uh, Walter Ben Michaels, uh, brought up in relation to like uh, be himself being accused of being class reductionist. And he says that um, we should just accept this. We should, you know, if, if we're, if we're serious about economic equality, and if we think that economic equality is one of the best ways of achieving um, a, uh, you know, a, a, a gain in terms of, um, not lifestyle, but uh, standard of living um, for everyone. Then you know why? Why avoid it? Why not? Why not just bite the bullet and say we're class reductionists? And there's you know a, a case that can be made in that uh, in that way. Um, I wouldn't avoid it completely. Obviously, I mean, Marxists emphasize political economy. Marxists argue that class is more determining than other forms of social structure. 
Um, so I, I, what I wanted to do with the essay is to address this question of, um, because you, you get this kind of um, basic, you know, this use of Marxism against Marxists. And it's typical for postmodernists and post-structuralists to do this, you know, to take something from Marxism and to use it against Marxists. And of course, as you mentioned, the left is this kind of amorphous category. And so you can get, let's say, ultra-Marxists or anarchists using, you know, Marxist concepts against more socialist, communist type leftists. Um, so it's it's good to be aware that these are problems internal to the left as well as you know uh, among different um, pe different kinds of perspectives on the political spectrum. Um, so the uh, the question of class reductionism emphasizes class analysis. There's no bar there's no Marxism without class analysis, and. What postmodernism and radical democracy and intersectionality in very different ways have tried to do is two things. One, use Marxist uh, methodology towards different ends. In other words, use Marxist class analysis, uh, historical analysis, but apply it to questions of uh, colonialism or apply it to questions of uh, sexuality. So for example, um, Simone de Beauvoir um, was somebody who was deeply uh, in, involved in dialectical materialism, which she applied to gender. So you could have like the same kind of like uh, materialist analysis of society, the kind of the, the same idea of ideology, of gender ideology, of mystification and of naturalization of ideology. So you've taken basically what is a kind of like Marxist methodology and applied it to gender. And um, some uh, theorists will do this in a socialist um, socialist sense, and others yeah. will will do it like Judith Butler in terms of um, gender trouble. You could yeah. see the you could see the Marxist workings in gender yeah. trouble, though it's not articulated as a queer Marxism, right? And and so so. I guess maybe the the question I had would be, is this a problem or or is this what's what's wrong with this uh, exactly? I'm not, not not to say that you think there's something wrong with it, but I'm just curious, like for the benefit of listeners, they're probably thinking, well, yeah, doesn't doesn't Marxism need to do that? Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, hasn't Marxism always done that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So then and where, where does the problem then come? And, and, you know, approaches that are pre-Marxist, right? We right. don't have to be, Marxists right. uh, are not limited to, to the writings of Marx and Engels or of Lenin yeah. um, and so on. Um, so, um, yeah, so what's the problem? I, re I remember teaching uh, the work of Griselda Pollock, who's a Marxist feminist, uh, to an undergraduate class. And the student who was at the front of the class said, well, what's her problem? <laughs> Why is she complaining? Um, so, um, the, uh, so, the, you know, I wrote, um, a short version of, of basically a lot of research, uh, on this issue. Um, uh, I don't know if, I don't know how like, uh, longstanding it, it would be, or, or even if it stands on its own at the moment, but it's called theses on class, uh, struggle and identity politics. Hmm. So it's just an, a, an, it's an attempt to sort of put in one short article um, some precepts that I find are helpful uh, in terms of moving forward as a left. Mm -hmm. um, some leftists would disagree. Uh, some, and, and I'm very much interested in what happened to Occupy Wall Street. Although yeah. Occupy Wall Street is not per se a socialist movement, uh, it nevertheless resonates with socialism. But right. uh, what happened to Occupy Wall Street? Where did it go? Did it go into, I mean, some of Occupy Wall Street went into the Bernie Sanders move, campaigns, right. went into right. the DSA. And um, some of those energies went into Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And I'm working right now. Group, uh, it's more of a um, uh, um, coming together of several groups called uh, Strike MoMA. Mm. Um, it's an, it's mostly people in the art world. Mm. There were a lot of uh, art groups involved in Occupy Wall Street. 
Mm. And after Occupy Wall Street, they just multiplied. There was Occupy Everything, Occupy right. Churches, Occupy Museums. There was yeah. the people working on the Sandy Hook um, disaster. Uh, and uh, the same way that after BLM, the art world just adopted that aesthetic and that kind yeah. of platform in, in ways. Yeah. Yeah. I've, yeah. And, and it's, now, very... it's, now, it's now interesting. You saw the uh, meme yeah. of the video in New York. I think at the, um, not the Smithsonian, I forget, uh, the Guggenheim. Hmm? Did you see that? Where the, uh, the artists were, were, uh, throwing these paper airplanes down into the lobby. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you saw this, it's really uh, stark, stark and, and terrifying, uh, okay. advocating, uh, the Im implementation of a no fly zone in Ukraine. Oh no, I haven't seen that. Okay, so it's the leading elite. That's art world, you know, uh, <laughs> advocating a no fly zone, which would, which would spell the, the, uh, at least NATO, if not the U S uh, involvement in, in that war. Right. So they're, they're pretty yeah. much, pretty much advocating yeah. war. Right. So, yeah, you know, I don't think this is strike MoMA. This doesn't sound like uh, strike MoMA. This, this sounds more like a rear guard, uh, yeah. uh action. I, I'll look into it. Um, yeah. I did write an essay called uh, From NATO to NATO, um, the class struggle from NATO to NATO, the mm -hmm. first NATO being NATO Thompson, who's a, a new social movement curator, mm -hmm. um, who's kind of, uh, kind of anarchist. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be involved in, uh, we don't have to concern ourselves with the state, with taking power and being involved in these big ideological struggles. We can do practical, pragmatic actions on the ground. Right. You know, on on a case by case basis, and I compared uh, his statement to a statement made by Barack Obama, which was almost identical. Yeah, obviously, yeah. To obviously to different ends, but both of them being both of them being what I would refer to as post representational politics. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and a lot of it, I think, in a, in a curious way, like if you look at Joshua Clover's work, or if you look at Endnotes, or if you look at some of the um, far left readings of blm and um even of post-occupy politics they put a lot of faith in the social movements as almost a messianic faith i would say right that you don't really have politics until you have the upsurge of a riot basically right and then that spontaneous act and we all obviously know what lenin would say about this as an accusing of ultra leftism and i think in a way it is um at the same time I am cognizant of the fact that since the alter globalization movement in the early 90s to now, you can kind of look at a bit a bit of a point by point series of uprisings. I mean, the Arab Spring, Occupy, BLM, you know what I'm saying? They do present an interesting um, way of thinking about the political antagonisms of our world in a global sense. Um, what do you what do you make of that? I know you're critical of the social movement um, kind of ideology, uh, but say, say more about that. Um, OK, uh, so many strands here, but um, yeah, I mean, this is I mean, what what, what uh, I welcome all of these uh, movements on the left. I'm, I'm I mean, you could consider me orthodox. As a Marxist, I mean, if if you ask me what am I, you know, I would say I'm a Marxist first and foremost. Uh, I identify as communist, but I understand that in the United States, the word communism doesn't um, translate as well as socialism, and so I, I use socialism. I mean, to me, they're the same, except the only difference is that uh, socialism is also enlisted uh, towards social democratic politics, and so. This is now referred to as democratic socialism, uh, which is a debatable uh, use of the term, right? I think it's really, I think the DSA is more of a social democrat um, politics. Um, and we see, we see where that's leading us at the moment, pretty much in the same neoliberal basket as, uh, yeah. as liberalism. So, uh, right. I mean, you, you quote AOC right when Biden was coming into power, that those in the socialist movement in the DSA who um, criticize Biden um, really are, are class reductionists uh, because 
at the deeper part of Biden's agenda, according to her, at least at that time, mm -hmm. uh, before he came into power, is a, a very progressive agenda in her view, right? It doesn't. It doesn't concern me uh, too much. Like these statements by AOC. What really concerns me is when Zizek says these things. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what pricks up my ears. Yeah. Um, so, for example, on the Brianna Joy Gray Bad Faith podcast uh, recently, Zizek is saying, you know, let's give Biden a chance. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's saying, um, and um, he, uh, you'll notice that. Over and over again, Zizek says um, this 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 line that comes from French politics, um, and it's kind of like a new social movement line. Um, oh, just to finish my previous thought, I, sure. I'm like I'm uh, I'm kind of uh, non-denominational when it comes to uh, pragmatic alliances on the left. I have no sympathy for uh, red-brown alliances. I, I don't uh, consider you know, uh, right wing, right populist forces, working class in that sense. Uh, they may be, you know, working people in itself, but they're not working people for itself. Uh, so I, I, I don't go to the left to the I don't go towards the center or the right uh, in my um, um, non denominational leftism, but I will work with people on the left. I will I'll work with liberals as well. Uh, who are interested in the public good. And, you know, like Zizek says, you can always get ideas sometimes from conservatives who, you know, whatever are working on something in a non-political way. Uh, that's always possible. Um, and um, so um, what was the other thing? Well, I think I think we've covered non-reductive materialism pretty well. I feel I feel like we've covered that. Uh, well, yeah, I want I want to get the back social to movement, the social movement piece. Yeah, to me, because I think okay. that's a big one now. Yeah, here's, a, here's a segue um, just in terms of theses on class struggle and identity politics. There are certain um, precepts that I find useful for thinking about and, and moving forward on some of these issues. I mean, the reason for it is that. I mean, we're killing ourselves. The the planet is in uh, dire distress, this, or not the planet, but uh, humanity and, and, and natural life is in dire distress. Uh, the ecological um, catastrophe will not make the case for leftism by itself. Uh, and it, I feel the same way uh, on many fronts, on many different issues. Uh, but I do think that if there's only socialism, only communism can save us from global catastrophe on an eco ecological level. Um, so there, there are these reasons to to sort of um, focus on these uh, class reduction issues, right? There, it's a very pressured uh, moment, and the real question isn't the real the real question isn't like you know let's let's accept class reductionism and, and just move on with the socialist struggle. I mean the, that's not really the, the the question for me anyhow on a kind of intellectual level it's whether we can do that i mean can we actually achieve this what and what stands in the way um, and this is the the question i asked myself also for the, my book don't network which was do do social media and do networks actually enable leftist politics or the, do they disable leftist politics and i'm sad to say a leftist publisher turned the book down because the, the book wasn't giving a positive answer to the you know the uses of technology like this kind of deterministic uses of technology for the left i don't agree that that is actually enabling that so whatever leftism we have is going to happen through many um fields and sectors and ide ideological spaces um not simply in terms of like a, a panacea like technology so it didn't qualify for specific uh a series, but I ask myself the same question. My research um, in the last four or five years has been on identity politics. And this is something that um, destroyed my life, <laughs> you know, in the 1990s and since then. Identity politics destroyed my life, destroyed my career. Um, so I have un unfinished business, you could say, with identity politics. Can you, can you say, I mean, if it's not too personal, can you say a little bit more about what uh, what that is. I mean, if if it's too personal, we can pass too. It's okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's actually it's not accurate because it's. I mean, from a Marxist point of view, it wasn't actually identity politics. It was something else. It was neoliberalism. It was the neo neo neoliberalization of identity 
uh, and other kinds of cultural politics in the 90s and since then. So that what looks like a struggle, I mean, what, what, it, what is basically a, a, a class issue and even a democracy issue and a human rights issue is framed as an identity issue. And so depending on who you are, uh, that framing can have a spontaneous basis in reality. If, for example, you're male, if, for example, you're heterosexual, if, for example, you're white, if, for example, you're Canadian, and so on and so forth, right? So these things can always be like these material facts, right? Depending on how you define your materialism can be relevant. And so as a Marxist, my critique, as a class reductionist, let's say, my critique is of a kind of Foucauldian eclectic materialism where every, every type of matterism is as relevant as the next, all the way through to new materialisms, where we're talking about humans, not as subjects, but as objects in a world of objects, um, or even objects as subjects. Um, so, um, so to get back to the theses, this is kind of my way of organizing some of these ideas and some of this material. So like one of the one of the sort of ground uh, lines would be the class or sorry, the, the, the labor and capital uh, struggle as, you know, the, the sort of um, um, the basis for socialist Marxist communist thinking. The class struggle, as Zizek argues in his uh, in his essay on postmodernism or class struggle. Uh, can take place directly. Like the real of class struggle is in some ways, you know, symbolized in some other way that um, the kind of post-representational, post-politics, the global petty bourgeois condition, if you want to call it that, um, doesn't allow the, 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 the class struggle to emerge directly. And uh, this has been caused historically for people to simply abandon Marxism, like say with radical democracy and the new left, and Stuart Hall and cultural studies is to say, well, this kind of class, this kind of class analysis just isn't adequate to address all of the concerns, interests, experiences of people. And so the dialectic has to, has to evolve. It has to incorporate all of these other possibilities. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another is a, uh, a Hegelian concept which has to do with the say master slave dialectic, which is relevant to me in terms of the, of the Lacan's four discourses, which I use to explain um, how this kind of petty bourgeois class, like let's say class reductionist petty bourgeois conflict actually advances. Um, when I organized, when I curated an exhibition in 2018, uh, we invited class war games, the uh, British collective class war games which play uh, Guy Debord's Le Jeu de la Guerre, Guy Debord's uh, Game of War, board game, which class war games uses to explore uh, different kind of strategic issues for the left over you know, the last 200 years, let's say. And the, I, I kind of gave it a specific framing as the curator who invited class war games, I gave it the framing as I, as I saw it, in the context of the global petty bourgeoisie, if the avant-garde, if vanguardism, like let's say the Leninist party, uh, if that kind of vanguardism is proscribed by contemporary politics, if in cultural terms, an avant-garde is not only not possible, but not, not thinkable for various reasons, technology, social media being one of the reasons sometimes given in this reductionist sense that I reject. Um, what you have is a left that is, on the one hand, uh, activist, new social movement left, and on the other hand, a kind of um, what we're seeing a little bit more since, af since after Occupy Wall Street, not so much in the um, uh, uh, DSA, but outside of the DSA, which is a sort of like return in some ways I think after Occupy Wall Street, there was a lot of anxiety on the part of academic, politically oriented leftist academics. They were worried that postmodernism was was uh, being threatened. And if postmodernism is being threatened, well, then so are different identity groups being threatened and the investment that cer certain people on the basis of identity um, 
uh, brought to their scholarly research, their work, their, their life's work. Um, so in a way it was kind of, I call it sort of like the revenge of postmodernism, like what we've seen in some ways after Occupy Wall Street, it's the revenge of postmodernism. And uh, of, there's obviously like st structural material reasons for this as well. I, mean, I wouldn't limit it to that, but I do concern myself with why it is that, you know, scholars like Joshua Clover, for example, um, or Nikhil Pal Singh, for example, or Robin D.G. Kelly, for example, and many others, uh, Angela Davis, um, why the investment in concepts like racial capitalism, for example, this um, uh, Cedric Robinson, uh, concept of racial capitalism. You're, you're, you're saying that maybe in a way, well, one way to possibly theorize that is that the petty bourgeois habitus um, really, really has a kind of um, an unconscious drive for the preservation of a certain status quo, right? So there's a certain institutional logic whereby the ideology that they champion really actually is not meant to be um, disruptive at the end of the day. Is that one way to think about it possibly? Well, yeah, this is this is how um, Etienne Belibar might talk about it. And I mean, he's not, for me, my favorite thinker on some of these issues because for him, it's it, it often comes down to very practical uh, strategic questions. Um, so for example, how, how are the concerns of the Gilles Noir going to be addressed? And the question I ask myself is, why is it that the Gilles Noir in France did not align with the Gilets Jaunes. You know, why, why did the two uh, movements merge together? Those are the kinds of questions that I would ask. What's, the, what, what's your take? What's your reading there? Maybe you could explain that uh, division too. Um, I, the answer I gave in an essay I wrote on the Gilets Jaunes is, is, or, or somewhere, maybe not in that essay, is that the Gilets Jaunes are for the most part poor uh, they're people who can't make uh, ends meet. And so they don't really have much to offer the Gilets Noir except for their solidarity, which is more sort of uh, tokenistic. And so their demands are made to the state. Their demands are made to the authorities. And so yeah. they, can make, they can make those demands in a parallel way. Um, yeah, like the, the, the Yellow Vest movement was, at least that side of it, was the emergence of one of the most intense truly uh, working class based movements that we've seen in a long time. And it, as far as I understand, uh, a lot of French academics didn't want to have anything to do with them. So in a way, it's it's a return to class in a, in a pure form, in a pure antagonistic form. And it shows the ideological thing there. Is that is that fair to say what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know if it shows class in a pure form. I think it might show subject in a kind of like unvarnished form. Uh, or even what uh, Necht and Kluge refer to as experience in that way. Interesting. And so, yeah, yeah, and so, you know, the, the, the academic discussion, the media discussion, the state discussion that, that comes with it is one of the things that the Gilets Jaunes have tried to not be uh, taken in by. Um, and so, you, you know, so you have this kind of uh, exploitation that takes place, and this is where the PMC critique comes in, right? because uh, the, you know, the, the professions go to work. And, and this is, I mean, this is why I'm thinking about, there's, there's at least four, five strands here I have to bring together. Um, this is why I'm thinking about the late uh, eight, 19th century, the late 1800s and bourgeois decadence, like the bourgeois decadence of that period, uh, which produced a lot of kind of strange things like art for art's sake, like uh, nihilism in philosophy, um, spiritism in science uh, that led to theosophy, that led to things like um, environmental determinism in terms of race theory, I had a lot of like uh, wretched uh, yet culturally fascinating uh, expressions. And so much of 20th century modernism was a reaction to that kind of bourgeois decadence, you know, this kind of like deepening of contradictions rather than resolving of contradictions, which explains why early on, there was confusion between the left and the right in the early 1900s. A lot of rightist movements came out of uh, socialist, syndicalist uh, um, orientations. And so the early thinkers, the, the sort of ideologues of fascism were trained in Marxist 
dialectical and historical materialism. They understood these methods. They simply disagreed with the class emphasis and they thought that nationalism and an organic definition of totality was uh, the, the sort of like the spirit, the zeitgeist that would unify people against bourgeois decadence. That's interesting you say because the postmodernists also incorporate Marxism, but in, in a very different way. Yeah. yeah. And this is, I mean, this is, this is like the, the, the gist it kinda, of it. It kind of tells you something about the power of Marxism in our, in our world since its emergence. Yeah. And I, when I wrote an essay, the last essay in my book, Vanguardia is called, um, I forget what it's called, the only game in town. And it's a response to the peer uh, assessment of the book where the peer reviewers, they didn't, they wanted something that addresses um, topics like uh, Simon Critchley's Infinitely Demanding, where, uh, in, in, in other words, they wanted something about identity. And it's like, that's, that's really not my beat, you know, that's, that's not what I'm doing. And uh, I've addressed, I had addressed this in my work like, yeah. in, in the 90s. I, I thought I, in the 2000s, I was very excited because in some ways we were getting away from identity politics and right. discourse theory. I mean, Deleuzeanism was sort of a hinge, right, between new social movements and postmodernism. And it sort of it sort of led things in this more sort of like critique of capitalism as schizo capitalism. Right. But it came with a lot of it came with caveats and it came with like its own baggage. Right. Right. Lar largely as a kind of, I would say, like anti Hegelian uh, Spinozist. You know, let's let's just skip the Enlightenment. Let's pretend right. that the transcendental break with metaphysics hasn't occurred. Mm -hmm. We can forget about Hegel and Kant and mm. we can have, we could keep Marx in it, you know? So, I mean, this to me is not Marxist science, right? Because Marxist science begins with the transcendental break. Mm -hmm. And that's why Marxism is not about, is not reducible to empiricism. Mm. And mm. so when it, when it comes to prefigurative politics, this is why I, I reject prefigurative politics as basically a kind of narcissism, a sort of anthropology, the kind mm. of like, a sort of self-ethnographic, self-admiring uh, kind of logic. Yeah. That, that in in uh, the introduction to a, a book I'm writing, I mean editing, I, I use the Lukacian, you know, narrate or describe um, reading of uh, literature. Mm. I, I I I termed it um, explain or or describe, because in a way, a lot of what new social movements do is they describe a situation. They say this is what's happening, mm. but, but they don't explain it. Right. And so this is very useful. To right. Or even 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 talking about like George Floyd as a lumpen. No, nobody, nobody would say, but he was a lumpen. Right. I mean, in a way. Right. Or even talking about the emergence of BLM as a response to austerity locally. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, George Floyd, Floyd's uh, status as a lumpen is maybe not as relevant as the um, status of the lumpen for the left like sure. what, is, what does right. the left make of the lumpen right which is you know the premise of the black panther party no nope. yeah nobody wants to have that conversation today right um yeah and part and the, there are structural reasons for it that i give which is that for the, on the one hand uh the, the the working class that interests the liberal class is the white working class right the liberal class is not concerned with the black underclass Right. It's, con it's concerned with the white working class. Why? Yeah. Because you can accuse it of racism, sexism, right. and homophobia and xenophobia. Right. And so you can sort of like have your anti-socialism politics taken care and in of. A way, in a way, they lose both the white and the black working class because it's such a condescending message, right? Absolutely. So, so uh, here's the thing. I mean, universalism is essential uh, in my work. And when you're a universalist, you, there's, you know, you can get, there's a fake universalism, which is, let's say, the concrete universal, right, which is, which presents itself as absolute, which wants itself to be complete and total, which is kind of like the classic bourgeois habitus in a sense. Um, and so Marxism has always been against this classic bourgeois habitus. It's always been a critique of that. Yeah. Um, and so if you, uh, you know, if you want to talk about, like, I mean, this is also the question of neutrality uh, in terms of institutions. Can institutions be neutral? 
and of course, it's, it, you know, the, the, the reaction is always, no, you can't be neutral. You're always, there's always skin in the game, uh, which means that there's always a game. And so if there's a game on, then there has to be skin. There has to be an investment in the game. So then you get into these kind of like uh, rational choice kind of uh, ways of thinking, which can be instructive, which can be in some ways, um, you know, in terms of a formal logic uh, at play. Uh, and we can talk about um, Macbeth uh, in mm. a second. Mm. Um, but um, um, yeah, so the, the Hegelian, I mean, for me as a Marxist, Hegelianism is dialectics are, Hegelian dialectics are essential to my sense of materialism, my, my understanding of materialism. And one of the things that Hegel describes very effectively is the relationship, I mean, people take this to be the master-slave dialectic, mm -hmm. but you can also understand it as the part and the whole. Or uh, And to make thing, things sort of helpful and easy, the self and the other. And um, so, you know, if you're like the invisible white patriarchal norm, you would assume yourself as a self and the people that you would racialize would be the other you know, othering of someone or objectification of someone. And you can find this in some ways in uh, Frantz Fanon's work, for example. Um, and so that's the, that's the understanding and the model that we need to move away from, right? In some ways, it's kind of like a, uh, it's like an unconscious or it's sort of like a, a generic element in a lot of identity politics. So that what happens is you, the, the person who's been othered wants to reclaim, wants to reestablish their selfhood. Uh, I watched um, King Richard last night about uh, the Williams sisters, and that's kind of what the film is talking about, right? It's about, uh, in, in some ways, a, a, a group of people who have been racialized as other, you know, claiming their selfhood. Right. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's the model we need to move away from, from a Marxist point of view. You, 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 let me just connect that for a second to the category of experience. Um, let me finish the, let me finish okay, the, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and finish. Cause I have a question about this yeah. like yellow vest, but go ahead. Yeah. Cause this, this one is in the, the theses and, uh, I think it's, it's key to, to helping, I, I, you know, maybe it just helps understand what I'm saying, but hopefully it's helpful to the movement. Um, the self is the totality. The self is not all of us. So it would be closer to something like Hardin Negri's empire, let's say. The self is the totality, and the totality is capitalism. The concrete totality, in Zizek's terms, is capitalism. Now, capitalism is obviously not an absolute, right? It hasn't been there forever. It may not be there forever. We may be moving into something. We don't know what comes after capitalism, but you know, it's not absolute. Um, yet it is the concrete totality that defines and determines and substantializes much of what you find within capital in a capitalist universe. So that the other is basically uh, all of us. So we're the other to capitalism's self, the same way that labor is the other to, in the uh, relationship, in the formal relationship to capitalism. So all of us, we're all others. So white people are other, black people are other, straight people are other, gay people are other. And, you know, you can get into the problematics of def defining identities in these neat ways, and that's, that's fair enough. Um, but so instead of thinking of a competition between selves it's all of us others who are competing against the self which is the concrete universal to, to in a in a sense of emancipatory universality to change the relations the social relations that condition our our product our, our life our production uh social value um and so this in, in so when you have the the capital labor uh, relationship that can't be, you know, directly um, uh, uh, fought, let's say, in terms of struggle, what you have instead is something like this NATO-backed conflict in Ukraine, where nationalism is, is at stake, where, you know, sovereignty and borders 
and the welfare of oligarchs is at stake where the military industrial complex is at stake. So instead of having a class war, we have these displaced pseudo conflicts. Um, and it's by and large the same thing with identity politics, because whereas the relationship between labor and capital is inherently conflictual, the relationship between straights and gays, whites and blacks, women and men is not inherently conflictual. Although on a psychoanalytic point of view, there is an, inher an inherent difference that can't be resolved. And so if, there if there's an inherent difference that can't be resolved, what often happens is that in this kind of like uh, institutional sense, it gets materialized into institutional protocols. So whereas in the late 1800s, you had science defining, you know, 18 different race classifications. Today you have science defining now it's up to like 50 plus sexual classifications, right? So this kind of like, the, the, in a way, the sort of like non-discursive aspect of sexuality, we, we try to keep up with it. We try to find symbolizations for it. We find institutional protocols for it. And we sort of have conflicts and res resolutions around yeah. these, these uh, problems. Can you can um, you say can you say a little bit more about this category of experience when you said or I'm sorry of this of subject of the subject um, you said that the dip, the the because the yellow vest really interests me and we've had other uh, a famous uh, French philosopher came on our program Mehdi Belhaj Kassem and he is um, pointed out this chasm that existed amongst the professionals and the academics when the yellow vest militancy emerged they they couldn't support it. And you said that that uh, pointed not to class, but to subject. And then you said experience. Can you say more about that? Um, well, I don't know if it's I did. It kind of goes back to the reference of the essay that you made by Kluge. The, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have uh, today. You have what's called an experience economy. You have uh, a notion of flexible subjectivity. And in a petty bourgeois sense, uh, the, the, you don't want, what, what you want is hexis, right? What you want is someone who is, uh, what's the, it, it's kind of like the, the difference between prophecy and bureaucracy. The bureaucrats in this kind of like, uh, what's the name of that film? with Tom Cruise. Bureaucrats are predatory. They want to know what comes next for various reasons. If it, it could be for security reasons. The, 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 the middle class or the PMC, they need a lot of information. They want a lot of information. And I mean, that helps us in a sense because their apparatuses help us understand also what's happening. Uh, but they want as much information uh, and knowledge as possible. I mean, this comes, uh, if you're a Foucauldian, I mean, it's not really what I'm talking about is, is not a problem. It's not an issue, right? Because your model is power knowledge. Your model is the will to power and the relativism of politics. You know, so you're basically in a nihilistic, your, your framework is nihilistic, in, in which case you're in free fall, right? You're having fun or you're not having fun. It really doesn't matter. Um, so Marxism is a more humanistic approach, uh, if you will, though it can also from a psychoanalytic point of view be uh, non humanistic, in, in that sense, right. So it's not uh, consciousness is not, for example, embodied, your embodiment could inform your consciousness. But you know, social theory is in the ether, right? The unconscious is not uh, as, as Lacan says, the desire is the desire of the other. So what you said earlier about the disappearance of desire, I don't think uh, from a Lacanian point of view is ever going to be a worry, right? I mean, the only thing that from a Lacanian point of view you, or psychoanalytic point of view you would think about is almost in the same way that Marshall McLuhan was thinking about these things is what, you know, what you're maybe more concerned with is like, you know, are people able to function in these, in these conditions? Are they stressed out? Are they suicidal? Are they becoming aggressive? Are they be, are they anxious? Like these kinds of uh, you know very like individual let's say problems that are that are not individual problems per se. 
um, though, you know, from a ninja, from, in terms of therapy, in terms of like the, the talking cure, the, the subject, it's almost like in Christianity, you know, it's like, yes, uh, everything is predetermined, everything is providential, but you have to, you know, you have to carry the faith. Um, so in some ways, it's the same way with um, uh, psychoanalysis. You, you, you're responsible for your own therapy, basically. Uh, the, um, the analyst is a vanishing mediator. Um, so um, to get back to the gilet jaune, it's a bit of a, and the gilet noir, I don't know, like, let me throw this out. Maybe it'll help us. Um, this is another thing that um, um, I find uh, helpful in terms of the reductionism uh, avoidance. Um, Rossier, in uh, his writings, came up with three different uh, forms of politics. And Zizek added a fourth. <clears throat> um, one is um, Archie politics, which is kind of, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily fascist uh, Zizek would define ultra politics basically it's kind of like a fascist politics ultra politics is a, is a struggle between us and them and the struggle is so stark that there's no room for politics so it's almost apolitical it's like it's total war it's it's mutually assured destruction um archie politics is a little is a mild version of ultra politics in a sense that it's premised on community it's premised on something like the face-to-face, -face, uh, face-to-face interaction. You know, people in your neighborhood, people that you know, uh, people with the same identity, um, and you know, fascism. I mean, you 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 can have it towards different kinds of uh, political expression, but fascism uses this kind of Archie politics to turn it into a kind of ultra politics. Um, though that's not the whole story. Um, and you also have uh, parapolitics, P-A-R-A, -A, um, which is basically a kind of like liberal consensus politics, where the function of politics is to make sure that uh, there's, there is an open conflict in society. So it's a sort of civil society discourse where there's different kinds of powers, police powers, military powers, institutional, church, school, etc. so that there's basically... You know, so that politics is kind of contained. Um, and then there's metapolitics, which is the closest thing to socialism in Ranciere's um, categories. Uh, in metapolitics, you basically have uh, the political economy as, you know, the, 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 the main concern, the main problem, the main cause and focus of politics. So if you can address issues at the level of political economy, much like uh, Adolf Reed and Walter Ben Michaels would advocate, if you can address politics at that level, that's your best bet to have, you know, the most progressive politics available. And so Bernie Sanders would fall in there, Corbyn would fall in there, kind of meta politics, and even like a, a communist politics would uh, be meta political. So in terms of um, the question of the gilet jaune and uh, like would the gilet jaune function as a meta politics or would they function as a kind of um, para politics? There, it's not clear because on the one hand, there's, there's like dissensus, there, there's no consensus. So it can't be a para politics. It's against the state. It doesn't even want representatives to be sent to the level of the state. That kind of pushes you if you don't want to be uh, like a, a, a labor organization, if you don't want to be a political party, it, it kind of pushes you in these kind of like other areas where you're almost doing Archie politics, right? It's communitarian in a way. Um, and this comes to, this sort of addresses some of the critiques that were made of the Gilets Jaunes, which I thought were, I mean, my, my problem with the Gilets Jaunes wasn't so much the confusion as to its, its, its um, it's social politics, like on the level of identity. Like I, I didn't see that being like a big problem, though there were incidents. Um, it's more the the problem of a it's a it's a kind of it's a national politics that doesn't want to take the standard form of representational politics. 
So it's a post-representational new social movement anarchist politics that wants to be like the five star movement. It wants to be like a, a traditional political party, but it wants to be democratic. It wants to avoid the alienation of mediation. Um, and so I think in, because of that, you get into all of these kinds of uh, very petty bourgeois um, conversion uh, strategies. You get like what John McWhorter, he's a conservative thinker. I don't agree with his politics, but um, I mean, he does a fairly good job of describing woke politics as a kind of cultishness. So you get this kind of cultishness with, with figures uh, like Bipo, who are very charismatic, right? Or even um, the president of Ukraine, uh, who's this charismatic, charismatic actor, where it's kind of like, there's, there's almost this kind of like direct connection between these charismatic figures and the people. They're one of them, right? Or the, he's one of us kind of thing, which is historically the, the profile of the fascist leader. Um, the fascist leader is the leader who's the closest to the people, right? He's, he's of the people and he's just like them. And, you know, obviously he isn't, but, but, you know, that's kind of like Trump, right? It's, it's a lot about his charisma. It's a lot about these things that have nothing to do with the political issues that on a, the, on a parapolitical or metapolitical level have to be addressed. No, they're all avoided through this kind of, uh, everything else, everything under the sun. And, um, the only difference with the fascist leader is that in the case of the fascist leader, the leader is the people. But yeah. he's the, the leader is the, the voice of the people. Yeah. What, what he says is what they say. So, yeah. you know, there's like, there's no gap. Right. Well, I, um, I know we've, I think we've done a good job. You've done a good job here bringing these threads together. Um, I want to, I don't, don't want to finish though on fascism. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, please, please. I, I just have one final question and we'll, oh, yeah. we'll wrap up in like, in like uh, 10 minutes, but please mm -hmm. continue that thread. Right. So the, the, I mean, in terms of fascism, in terms of the threat of fascism, um, I think like one, one thing to keep in mind is the operativity of the white working class as a scapegoat for neoliberal politics, for liberal and neoliberal politics. And, you know, Jacobin has done a great job of uh, demystifying that, uh, that problem. Um, and there's the flip side to that, which I don't think is useful, which you find on, you know, uh, in the populist, say, uh, rhetoric of someone like Crystal Ball, which is, when you say working class, just say multicultural working class, right? So just be specific that the working class is not the white working class, but that it involves um, people from all walks of life. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's obvious, but I don't think that's Marxist. Why? Right? Because in a way you're, you're sort of trying to, you're trying to avoid the problem of universalism rather than, right. rather than, uh, you know, addressing it head on. You're kind of like, in a way you're trying to cover over or pave over the, the, the issue. Um, and the other thing is in terms of uh, fascism, there are different- you're trying, to, you're trying to play the liberals rhetorical game better than they better than they can. But if you play on that terrain, you're always gonna lose. Right, right. And um, I, had, I had this in mind for today's uh, discussion. Uh, uh, so micropolitics, insofar as uh, let's say like Foucauldian micropolitics, are premised on a kind of like Nietzschean um, nihilism, you know, in a philosophical sense. There's a there's a critique of this actually by uh, Pluck Rose and Lindsay in Cynical Theories. Yeah, but Lin Lindsay Lindsay has become kind of like a really, I know yeah yeah like I know he's politics he, now yeah 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 I think but, he's an um, example of the wrong way to deal with this issue yeah yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, but cynical theories, nevertheless, I mean, there's, there are things in cynical theories. I mean, there've been Marxist critiques of postmodernism, you know, over the, over the decades, this wouldn't be the first one. What makes it different is that it's targeting, uh, what Zizek is also dismissed as cultural Marxism. You know, in, in the Peterson interview, uh, Peterson said cultural Marxism, Zizek said, well, they're not Marxists. And that was his way of like resolving that, that, that issue. But I mean, Jordan Peterson's, um, I mean, his target is 
social justice warriors, supposedly, but we've seen since then that really what his target is, is the left. So from social justice warriors, you can dismiss the Frankfurt School. From the Frankfurt School, you can dismiss Marxism. And from Marxism, you can dismiss Hegel. Once you take Hegel out of the picture, the others follow, fall like dominoes. Um, so, you know, I'm not with them, but th th their critique of the, the postmodern premises of um, social justice type activism is accurate. It could have been said by anyone teaching postmodern theory. It could have been said by any leftist critical of postmodern theory. Some of their conclusions and some of the other things they come up with is, is a different story. Um, but uh, what I'm developing, I mean, in terms of microfascism, right, the, the real issue is, is there any semblance between micropolitics and traditional, let's say, modernist politics? Is the right-left spectrum that we use to talk about Marxism and socialism, is the right-left spectrum irrelevant to micropolitics as a Foucauldian might think or might argue? That's one question. If it isn't, right, then you might ask yourself, well, is this micro, is this micro practice, is it liberal? Does it recognize people's human rights? Does it acknowledge human rights? Does it care about people's feelings? If it cares about people's feelings, how does it relate those feelings to other questions, like the feelings of others, the feelings of, not the feelings, but like the, the I don't know, the, I mean, norms, let's say, anything that's normative, anything that's quote unquote accepted, right? The, this, this could be seen as a problem, the block of discourse that must be um, deconstructed, or it can be seen as something like what Zizek refers to as light culture, you know, things that we kind of agree on so that we can function or so that, so that right. we could co coexist. Right. So if, if your goal is to attack all normies um, and, you know, how, how do you distinguish a kind of like, say, vanguardist sex politics from an incel type of discourse? Right. 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 Um, and so that's why I find the, the concept of microfascism uh, useful because in, in a sense, what makes what is what makes the uh, the micro politician person um, fascistic? Knowing the history of fascism helps. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the things would be nihilism as a core fundamental premise. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you can you can go beyond uh, Nietzsche's definitions. Yeah, sure. Um, and the will to power. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we use this term all the time, empowerment. Like we define, yeah. a lot of people define politics as empowerment. I'm sorry, empowerment is, is not a politics mm -hmm. in, and of its, in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and cross-class alliances, right? Yeah. The idea that, um, you know, billionaire blacks are on the same basics, are part of the same struggle, part of the same freedom struggle as all other blacks you know this this is a kind of to me micro political micro fascist uh direction yeah i mean i think rhetorically you're going to get a lot of pushback on that because of um you know for obvious reasons the use of fascism so i mean i i i see the I, i'm i'm curious to see how you develop this as you do more research on it um i personally <laughs> am personally um probably um because solidarity is extremely important for me as a Marxist, and I'm just not sure that that kind of framework is going to further uh, the types of education, the types of solidarity that's needed. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I just yeah. I, I worry about that. Yeah. Okay. From I mean, from a Marxist point of view, there's there's a um, not to uh, not to push back, Daniel, but um, one of the things that I, I say is um, that. Uh, what we have today, like from a non-Marxist point of view, is um, more in this kind of like um, dark uh, mirror, you know, the TV series, Twilight Zone, Dark Mirror. Uh, like, unfortunately, that series went in a, in a sort of Baroque postmodern, like um, simulation, hyper-reality direction. Like what started off as interesting became this more sort of like, you know, no exit kind of uh, program. Um, but um, one of the, one of the, you know, concepts that I use is that in terms of Foucault and Deleuze and Deleuze's uh, societies of control is that what we have today in terms of a division of uh, suffering is that we have discipline for the losers and control for the winners, right? That's right. 
That's right. So even if you're a winner, you're still you're still like locked in. Right. These are terms that I reject from a, a, a Zizekian, Lacanian, Hegelian oh, yeah. point of view. Right. Well, also, yeah, from a purely purely Marxist point of view as well. I mean, it's 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 the and world from a Marxist. It's, it's it's the world of Nietzsche. I mean, this is this right, is, right. So this, I mean, the threat, this is the, the the Manichean division that Nietzsche wanted, right? Well, I don't know about that. Uh, I it's mean, my view. I I, I definitely. <laughs> anyways, go on, go on. Yeah, I, I'm, that's why I mentioned these theses on class struggle um, and identity politics because those are those are my uh, you know that's the point of that's the, that's the point from which I'm working. Um, so, if you know, even in terms of uh, labor and capital, it's not a Monarchian relationship. It's not a dualism. So, um, the, I mean, I live in in a situation where you could say it's, it's a control situation as opposed to a discipline situation. And the, the thing about control is that, you know, it doesn't involve freedom, right? So it's like the, the metaphor is you're on a highway, you feel free because you're going fast in your car, you know, but really the highway is dictating your movement. Right. And, um, you know, in terms of uh, scholarly work, I could get pushed back on the highway. Somebody might cut me off. Somebody might pull me over to the side, right? Mm -hmm. And that's and that's fair enough. But that's only if I think in terms of control societies, in terms of my research, in mm. terms of in terms of what I'm working on. Mm. Uh, and um, I am putting together a, a reader, an edited text, and it's called "Identity Trumps Socialism." which is a title that I developed as a slogan. Mm -hmm. um, and the claim that I make is that if you're pursuing identity politics today, you're basically, whether you want to or not, whether you know it or not, working for the 10 and 1%. Mm. Um, and this is, you know, I, I, this is my critique of, and you know, this is not to say that we don't have identities and we shouldn't have yeah, identities. Right. It's not to say that racism doesn't exist, that sexism doesn't right. exist, and that these problems are not problems that we can continue working on. That's right. that's not the point. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. Right, of course. Um, because people have been, people that are otherized <laughs> by identity, they've been told that they are, they've been educated that they are, and they do then, therefore, also, it's a feedback loop. They experience it that way, and those yeah. feelings and that experience is real, and, you know, it, it, can, it can be um, quite, quite... Um, they insist on their status as other. I mean, in yeah. this kind of like resentful way, or in okay. in, in or in in a, in a positive way, like um, uh, Franz Fanon addresses this issue, right? In a in a situation where you're identified as a black man, um, there's like two obvious responses. One is you you deny it and you simply want to be just a person, and the other is you embrace it. And you say, you know, I'm going to embrace my blackness and I'm going to assert my blackness and so on. And those two paths are two paths that he rejects. He says, reaching for the universal. So the question then becomes, well, what is the universal? The, the, the way to avoid what Fanon says is to say, well, that the, the universal is hedged. The universal is, is, is already predetermined. It's the white superstructure. It's the, it's the capitalist superstructure. Um, so we wouldn't simply want to become, you know, this is kind of Angela Davis's uh, critique. We don't simply want power, you know, under any circumstances. Um, but in some ways, it, 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 it a little bit avoids what Fanon is talking about, right? And in a, con in a context where you have the neoliberalization of culture and politics, where you have the repressive desublimation of culture, the repressive desublimation of politics, uh, it, it's it's as if those are the only those are the only uh, possibilities, right? Like the whole notion of potential is is determined by these possibilities. This is what leftists in the '60s used to say: the possible and possible. So that identity, rather than like humanity, or rather than uh, emancipation, rather than emancipation becoming the possible and possible, it's yeah. like identity becomes the possible and possible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, geez, it's it's a it's an incredibly, um, in many ways, what you're doing is is quite um, cutting edge. I must I must say, I mean, it it, it has, um, you know, it's it's courageous too. It's 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 um, 
this is um yeah this is this is very interesting and i definitely want to have you back on to continue to discuss these themes um yeah yeah it's, yeah it's, it's sure. been a great conversation did you want to say anything in like final couple of minutes yeah here? yeah um zizek uh he has this slogan that he got from um new social movements in france mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know where or when it emerged, but I know that Badiou talks about it, and uh, he says this: um, "Tout ce qui bouge n'est pas rouge." Not everything that moves is red. Uh, red meaning uh, communist. So um, this would be mm -hmm. kind of like a new left slogan: like not not everything in, that's relevant politically is socialist politics. Right. Um, and Zizek says this all the time. Yeah, Badju um, Bad is, uh, he calls this the movementist tendency of, of Foucauldianism. And he's very opposed to movementism. Yeah, yeah. yeah similar to that. Yeah. And uh, so Badju's um, retort to this slogan is not everything that moves, tout ce qui bouge n'est pas événement. Not everything that moves is on the order of an event. And um, Zizek, for some reason, he gets it, he, he flips it like, you know, like he does with so many things. So he has the, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't, he says, Badiou, you know, there's this line from Badiou, not everything that moves is red. Mm. That's, that's not the line from Badiou. That's the line that Badiou is criticizing mm. with his mm. notion of event and saying that not everything that moves is on the order of an event. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting for us who are like Zizek uh, scholars, Zizek, yeah, uh, Zizek fans. Um, I don't know if you saw the the video he posted in support of the protesters in Moscow. Um, and he did this thing where that he's doing like almost now routinely, mm -hmm. uh, which is dismissing the left, like he's saying these uh, these stupid leftists, these dumb internationalists, these uh, sectarians, um, and. Um, it's kind of like uh, it's an interesting problem. I mean, for us, like, why why is Zizek? I mean, who who does he who does he understand when he says if he says sectarians and internationalists? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we know who who he's talking about. Yeah. If he says the left, then we're not too sure. I mean, it could right. be could be a lot of different uh, yeah. expressions. So, anyways, this has been a a, a blast. I want to I don't want to respect your time and. Um, I think we should pick this back up again uh, in the future if you if you'd be up for it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And maybe even bring on uh, others for a kind of wider panel conversation, etc. And sure. um, and I'll link to your uh, website and your your uh, books in the in the show notes. And just want to thank you, Mark, for your time. And I love I loved the conversation. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, see you next time. You got it. <laughs>